Okay, so as I was talking about the military versus civilian organizations, uh, let's say civilian job site versus military job site, and uh, the hierarchical uh, uh, type of expectations we'll have, the other thing we've got to look at among veterans is, uh, you know, what are the expectations for profitability and sustainability? Uh, a lot of times we look at who is in charge, and we have a lot of people where in the past their leadership style was based on the fact that some higher authority has appointed them to where they're at. And everybody gets their, their sustenance from the big paycheck in the sky. Everybody's getting an equal level of sustenance. So the way we would judge somebody is going to be relatively according to pretty consistent standards. I mean, we, we judge somebody's success. We judge how they work. Um, you know, if, if I were this overweight in the active duty military and everybody says, well, wait a minute, we all get it up at the same time, we're all supposed to do PT at the same time, how the fuck is it you're overweight and these guys are in shape? There must be something you're not doing. In the civilian sector, then we look at things and we say, well, these guys are, you know, these guys work this schedule, I'm working 12 hours a day driving a truck, this guy works 6 hours a day doing something that's more physical or, or one guy works at a desk. Uh, probably the best shape of my life was not when I was doing physical labor, but when I worked a white collar desk job, but I went to the fitness club every evening. Okay, that was the best shape of my life. I worked a white collar desk job. So that doesn't necessarily mean that in, in people in the civilian world with civilian background are gonna have uh, the most consistent situation that you can equally judge by. And that gets into the character judgments that you're going to make in order to determine what kind of people you want to be able to involve yourself with in a, in a survival group. Because the type of character that it takes to deal with different types of situations is not necessarily the most consistent across the board. And one of the things people coming from the corporate world and the military wor uh, world that they begin to recognize is backstabbers get ahead, and they do. But what they're doing is they're constantly trying to prove some kind of an outside, you know, they're trying to, they're, they're, they're trying to gain the approval of that outside authority, and they know that if they fuck somebody over, that's cool, that victim is going to be less likely to reach back at them. Um, you'll see that in the corporate world, you'll see that in the military a fair amount. Although in a wartime military, I think you see it a lot less because the stakes are higher. And in survival situations, I expect to actually see that a lot less because the stakes are higher. So when you see bad behavior, uh, you know, you want to look at it in the perspective of, you know, what are the circumstances of that? The other thing that I think is a very dangerous slippery slope is to use um, inconsistent judgments on what is bad behavior. Um, we have a lot of people in our current society who would say that I want to live by one moral standard when everything's normal, but I'm going to live by a different moral standard when things are not normal. And I would say that if you're going to engage and certain levels of moral relativism, we would need to know where that stands because a lot of times the desperation of moral relativism is something that somebody is there is a circumstance that somebody has created. And I've seen that more in the no, I'll take it back. I've seen it in both the civilian side and the military side. Uh, civilian example was a, um, a communal retreat situation where the leadership elements of it were all ex-military. Uh, one officer, two enlisted were, were the people running it. Nobody else was. And they were taking in a lot of people who were not. And there was one guy who came in. He was uh, a trust fund trust fund guy, but his trust fund didn't pay him enough to live a big comfortable lifestyle, but it did pay him enough that, I mean, he could cover some things if he lived really cheap. I think he was getting about 450 a month, 
And it, when he got his welfare and food stamps and some of that stuff on top of the trust fund money, I mean, he, he did okay, but he didn't do that great. And I think it was some kind of a welfare food stamp eligibility with this guy. And so he'd come to the retreat, and uh, he, he would have some kind of little entrepreneurial thing going on, and he'd stay for a little while, and he was kind of one of those guys who was desperate to prove himself to go beyond being a trust fund guy, because I, I think at that stage he was in his early 30s. And he, 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 his car was always out of gas. So his emergency was, after showing up, is he kind of get into our fuel bank. We had gas cans and motor oil. I had a little POL set up, a, a, a little fueling area in that where we stored fuel for emergency stuff. And at one of the group meetings, I had said, well, I, uh, you know, if somebody has an emergency, if you really need gas, you know, use it. We're, you, you know, I spent the money on the gas. It was back when it was just like two, two fifty a gallon. I mean, it wasn't incredibly expensive. It's just that every time I went there and I needed gas for a lawnmower or a chipper or something, um, and I had a pretty big, pretty big gas, you know, a couple of five gallon gas cans. Well, one's empty and one's half full. And nobody really owned up to it. And a guy was gone, and I was like, well, somebody got into it. And I, finally, I, I see the guy out there at like 6 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we lived in far northern California. He had to get to San Francisco by, I don't know, 7 or 8 a.m. or something. So he was in a hurry. And I said, listen, you, you know, we're almost out of gas, man. He goes, well, I, I got to fill up here because I'm not going to have time to stop for gas. I got to be there really early. And I said, well, you know, you haven't, I, I don't think I've seen you buy any gas either. And I said, you know, you're kind of running this low on this stuff. Said, well, I don't have a lot of money on you, blah, blah, blah. And then later on, uh, uh, it, it, somebody invites everybody in for breakfast. And I kind of was going to put him on a spot. And I said, listen, I think I know where the gas has been going. He's, he's in a hurry. And, and he says he's not going to have time to stop for gas on the way out. So he hands me a five dollar bill and says, oh yeah, well here you go, you know, that'll cover the gas I'm taking today, I'm just taking a few gallons. And I'm adding up the number of miles, and he had one of these cars that gets good fuel economy and everything, and I'm thinking, well, no, I think he came in a little short on that five bucks, you know, I mean this guy was really skinning it, and, and I didn't want to have to stop in town and go to the gas station to fill, refill the cans. So uh, after he left, we had another meeting, and he was, you know, basically invited not to come back. And if he wanted to change that decision, he, he needed to come back with, like, a lot of gasoline. You know, and we, we just made it really fair. You know, we said, listen, dude, you, you know, you've you kind of been taking a little more than given. And uh, it's nice to have you be company. You know, you talk the talk just fine. But, you know, the, the, the commitment and the artificial emergencies, which seem to break into everybody else's supplies all the time, it was just too much. And, um, you know, we weren't hating on a guy, we weren't angry at him, we weren't going to beat him up, any of that, but we just said, listen, man, it's, it's, this, uh, you know, it's not cool. Um, on the military side, we've had situations where, um, in, in Iraq, I don't know about Afghanistan, but when my unit was, I was in the National Guard, we're doing like pre-mobilization training, which I did, I didn't go to... Uh, the sandbox of the unit, but that's another story. But we were told that 40% of the casualties over there were due to work-related accidents. And if there was one thing that had me thinking all the way back through my active duty time, my National Guard time, and a lot of that stuff was that the military tends to have pretty good health insurance. If you get injured on a job, they're going to take care of you for life. There's also a very strong incentive among the leadership to get stuff done at the expense of others. Um, I, I uh, uh, one of the one of the situations they, I didn't get busted for it, but they they withheld a promotion uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, and uh, this little shit of a corporal was telling me that uh, you know I had to work late at night. I had a, I had to. Uh, basically wasn't going to get the, I didn't get chow, and I was really skinny at the time, and my performance would really, really drop, because I was a very low body fat person, and, and I didn't get chow, they hadn't issued jackets, the Marine Corps at that time wouldn't issue a jacket, you stay, 
you can't fit a career, and they wouldn't even sell the field jackets at the PX. And I had to work out in the cold at night and uh, with some other people, I wasn't alone. We had to work out in the cold that night with some other people to load some trucks. They had to get loaded on some other stuff. And um, at about 9.30, I'd go into the office areas and I'd catch him and, and the other NCOs with, uh, you know, a pretty big haul of Burger King food. And they were just finishing it up. And uh, so I grabbed him, I pulled him across the desk, and, and before I could really wail on him, the, you know, the other people pulled me off. And, uh, you know, was it jealousy over the privilege of his rank? No, the asshole wasn't taking care of us. And they fully expected to collect awards for the work that they weren't doing. They fully expected to be able to go and collect a, talk to the higher, higher ranking officers the next day and say, yeah, we got the troops to do this, this, and that, we got it all done last night. Uh, you know, where, where's a little uh, achievement medal for getting all that stuff done? And because I knew how the fucker was, I knew how the gunny in that unit was, and the awards that he had on the wall, and every one of those fucking awards that guy had was for work other people did. You know, that fucker wasn't he. I, if he pulled his weight, I'd be fucking surprised. And um, if there's one thing anyone would say throughout my military career, is uh, if it came time to work, I fucking pulled my weight. Okay, and, and that's the uh, the whole damn thing. And you can look at my rank, you can look at my records. Uh, I was never in an empty coffee pot fill ashtrays uh, role. Never was there. Okay, always pulled my weight. And uh, if, if somebody had something bad to say, it was because I made them look bad. That was pretty much it. And uh, in survival organizations, there isn't anything to gain by forcing other people to do something they otherwise wouldn't do. There really isn't. There's nothing, there's nothing that leader gains by bullshitting people into doing something like that because you're going to have to live with the people later on. And that's where the survival group dynamic is different from the civilian workplace and the military. In a lot of respects, it's going to be different from some of these other groups. Anyway, that video, I don't know if we're going to keep.